Good afternoon, class. Um, I wanted to record the screencast to, to follow up on comments that I didn't quite complete in our time together uh, this morning. And you might recall that our, our focal point, um, if we only had one word to describe what, what we're after today, it's really this issue of development. And when geographers use the phrase development, it actually signals a whole host of different considerations and factors, um, you know, a lot of different tools of measurement that involve things like gross national income, gender equity index, human development index. These are all essentially measures that are aimed at capturing different pieces of this larger puzzle that we might consider to be global development. And uh, so I'm going to brush rather quickly through the beginning parts because in class today I talked a little bit about things like modes of production and human well-being but uh, if you do need to take a little moment to um, brush up your uh, your notes um, you're certainly welcome to do that by, by um, um, making use of these slides here. I'll quick, quickly move through here uh, a little bit. Um, developing, developed, uh, when we talk about developed regions of the world, we're talking about regions of the world that seem to demonstrate a, um, a rather high material standard of living. Uh, and in class, I sort of made the reference to different stuff. Um, you know, material prosperity and material standards of, of living are those things that we can see, our clothes, our homes, our cars, our... Um, our tools, so on and so forth, but it's also worth noting that things and materials aren't necessarily the same thing as well-being and happiness. And so even geographers are careful to uh, not overstate um, the significance of development. Although it's worth noting that uh, well-being is oftentimes well served by at least a minimal level of material um, prosperity and material standards of living. So more on that as we go. I introduced to you in class the four different uh, modes of production, um, ways in which a society or region um, goes about meeting the um, demands of, of existence, um, how it pays its bills, how it puts food on its tables, how it builds its homes, so on and so forth. And I made reference to these four different modes of production, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. Hopefully those are starting to um, sink in for you a little bit. If not, feel free to talk to me at office hours or, or otherwise. Um, and so this notion of human well-being is a little bit different. It's part of the overall development um, puzzle. Uh, but this is kind of an effort whereby geographers note that um, a region of the world can be highly developed and have a high level of material prosperity or a, a high material standard of living, but it does not necessarily mean that that region is well. Like, for example, one thing that comes to mind is, um, you know, Japan, uh, despite being one of the most developed countries in the world, particularly in the last few decades, uh, it suffers from a relatively high rate of suicide. Um, you know, similarly, uh, the United States suffers from a high rate of homicide. Um, other uh, countries in Europe suffer from high rates of addiction, so on and so forth. So just because a region is materially prosperous does not mean that it is well or it has a high level of human well-being. Um, but, uh, you know, things like clean water and education, uh, roads, so on and so forth, those are oftentimes levels of development that help make human well-being possible. Uh, we just have to be a little careful. Uh, I want to provide you with this slide. You can um, slow this down and, and, and note some of these if you like. But the United Nations, which we haven't spent really any time discussing yet, but the United Nations is a international uh, organization that uh, has taken upon itself a number of different um, 
you know, it tends to evaluate and promote what the United Nations and its members view as positive attributes of a healthy world. And so among the many different things that the United Nations uh, takes on as its responsibilities, uh, it has a broad framework known as the Millennium Development Goals. And these are goals that it is hoping to realize and bring um, to more parts of the world. So these are fairly straightforward. Um, and there are a, a relatively, you know, there's I think seven of them, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Eight. Sorry. Uh, and they are eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, promote gender I'm sorry, achieve universal primary education, promote gender equality and empower women, reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, combat HIV, malaria, and other diseases, ensure environmental sustainability, and develop a global partnership for development. Now, these are um, obviously ambitious goals and wide-ranging goals. And it's worth noting that um, in some ways, these goals get a little bit at the, at the notion of there being a universal, um, a set of universal human rights, right? Everyone has a right to, say, a primary education or a right to a, uh, a livelihood or, a, I'm sorry, a, a life that is free of poverty or free of hunger. Um, all children have a right to live to the age of... 10 or you know something like that um, but these can sometimes in some cases be controversial as well because uh, not all reasonable people agree that there should be this notion of universal um, human rights um, and uh, in some cases the United Nations Millennium Development Goals suffer pushback from certain uh, parts of the world um, based on to what degree do governments and international organizations um, owe it to their people to, to realize these different goals. But nonetheless, they are important and they suggest um, a, um, a set of goals largely for non-governmental organizations uh, to try to bring about. So the International Red Cross, um, the World Health Organization, um, uh, national government, governmental organizations that advocate for women, and women's rights and women's health and education, so on and so forth. So I present these to you so that you'll have a glimpse and you'll know that there are world bodies like the United Nations that are um, focusing upon improving and increasing levels of development throughout the world. Okay, so how do we measure these things? Well, one of the most important measures, and this might uh, ring a bell to you, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, ring a bell for you. Um, this um, measure, until very recently, would most likely have been gross domestic product. But gross national income is a concept that's fairly closely related to gross domestic product. Essentially, what gross national income is, is, as it says, a measure of total value of income by the people of a country within a given year and it will be the go-to measure that our textbook uses for evaluating different countries and regions. Um, it's a major measure of development. Uh, and if you think about this, so Americans who have um, income that is realized within U.S. borders, but also in some cases, um, it could be income that's generated in countries uh, in other parts of the world. For example, if you are a uh, Apple CEO or heck even if you're an Apple stockholder, some of the income that you derive is based on production that's happening in China where you know computer chips are being generated. According to gross national income, all of that income, regardless of where it is being created, if it's if it is income for someone who uh, it lives in the United States, then it is considered part of the United States gross national income. Now, this is a useful term because it suggests to you how much um, value is created by the people, I'm sorry, value within the global economy 
that is created by people who live within a certain region. So this map suggests to you, it shows to you, you know, people in Australia have a gross national income of between 25 and $40,000. Um, so again, you take the overall gross national income and divide it by the uh, number of people who live in that country, and that gives you that country's uh, GNI. Okay. Now, GNI is also uh, most often paired with a, um, you'll hear a phrase, purchasing power parity. And what purchasing power parity does is it's an effort to adjust the gross national income um, per capita to the cost of living within that world region. So for example, um, a Big Mac in Japan would cost a lot more money than a Big Mac in Mexico. And so what geographers and economists do is they try to create a sort of apples to apples comparison. So if the cost of living in one country, like say Japan or Dubai or Germany are rather high, um, you know, you're going to have to make more money. You're going to have to have more income to live at a certain level of, um, you know, a certain standard of living there. Well, if it's a lot cheaper to live in India, then um, the gross national income per capita for an India, a member, uh, a citizen of India will generally be adjusted so that they can, um, you know, if it's cheaper to buy a Big Mac, if it's cheaper to buy rice, if it's cheaper to travel from point A to point B, then the purchasing power parity will be reflected and essentially Indians will be bumped upward and the Japanese will be bumped downward because their cost of living is so high, effectively they aren't make they have to make a lot of money to live to a certain um, you know to, to meet the needs based on the cost of living in Japan. I hope that makes sense. Well it, it should solidify more as we revisit the issue um, throughout the course. Okay, so gross national income is an important um, uh, measure. Now there are problems with gross national income and that is is that it assumed well if you don't look closely you could assume that wealth distribution is fairly equal and one of the things that we know um, in the United States particularly over the past um, few decades is that income distribution has become um, about as skewed as it has ever been like you have to go almost all the way back to the 1920s to see wealth distribution that is so, um, I guess, not very evenly distributed. So um, what gross national income doesn't do a very good job of telling us is just because there's a lot of um, income being made by the people in a world region or in a country, you divide that by the total number of people, but that doesn't mean that each person is getting that much. In fact, usually it doesn't, right? Because in a capitalist system, resources are not allocated um, just based on, by virtue of someone um, being a person, it's based on the value of that person's contributions um, to the economy. So um, that's one uh, limit that geographers sometimes know with regard to gross national income in terms of what it tells us about development. The other thing is, is that it only measures um, transactions within a formal economy, right? So uh, when my son, my 10 year old goes next door and is paid $15 to mow the neighbor's lawn, that transaction isn't being registered in the formal economy. There was income generated but it's not reflected in this um, formal economy. Uh, similar, similarly, if people play in a band, sometimes they'll be paid under the table. Obviously, illegal drug trade, um, uh, illicit uh, sectors of the economy, like say prostitution, they rarely are registered in a formal economy. Also, barter, if you um, just trade things um, with a neighbor, that's not going to be shown. So geographic patterns of well-being, I'm just going to click through these slides and we'll probably revisit this briefly at the beginning of class tomorrow because I'm about to run out of time. But you might want to jot down this definition of human well-being and then I'll probably start off tomorrow talking about um, HDI and GEI. And with that,
and show you these and we'll call it good. Um,